Thank you so much for that, Bernie. I think in your work you're really highlighting the importance of uh, complexity and how, in terms of how organizations and systems respond to uh, health equity. One of the things you mentioned was just was interesting for me watching that transition over time in DC, and I think that some of that change really speaks to the importance of the context within which organizations find themselves and how you know the loss of universal programs then lead organizations to shift. Um, what they do. So really resonating with some of the things which we are exploring through this initiative. So before we move to the next section of our uh, presentations today, I'd like to get a sense from you. So Bernie talked about a couple of things which organizations need to keep in mind in terms of making health equity a priority. So what, in your experience, in your present organization, are some of these present? And if they are, which of these? And you can select as many as you would like here. So we're just trying to figure out which of these are showing up in your work? All right, great. So lots of folks are saying health equity is a priority, and this work we done to promote health equity. That seems to be where a lot of work is happening. Uh, a couple of people, the hospital group is talking about uh, driving the agenda, and I saw a few more uh, there, so thank you for those. Uh, it was also very interesting to see the responses in the chat box in terms of what supports your work. So I just want to share a few. So really consistently, folks are highlighting the importance of embedding health equity into strategic planning, into resource allocation, the importance of shared decision making, uh, as well as time for partnerships with other organizations, and also really clarifying the values which guide the work we do. So thank you for sharing those experiences. So the next section of uh, the webinar today, I'm going to spend some time talking about the Organizational Capacity for Health Equity Initiative, which the NCCDH has been supporting since 2018, and uh, walk you through a little bit of the approach we've been using, as well as some of what we're doing in terms of the, what we're calling our working framework. So you'll feel a lot of resonance with what we're doing and what Bernie just talked about, because we're really trying to build on work which is already out there and spend time through the learning circle really exploring those ideas and testing them in the context of the practice site. So the NCCDH has some experience using a learning circle, and in 2013 or so, we ran a learning circle focused specifically on equity, integrated population health status reporting. I think through that process, as well as through what we had learned before we launched that particular initiative, we really became clear that um, a learning circle is a great way to integrate both research and practice-based evidence, as well as experiential knowledge and learning. And so you can see from the quotes on the screen that from our past experience, uh, a past learning circle member noted that sometimes the best discussions were the unplanned ones that came from exploring people's experience with doing the work. So typically when we go into learning circle conversations, we have some identified themes and uh, discussions are really organized around that, but the way the agendas are, get, are developed is fairly flexible so that members can confirm uh, confirm the ideas which we're bringing forth or say, nope, that doesn't resonate with my experience and I think we're missing a whole bunch of literature in this section. And also, members can take the direction in different places, and I think that really provides for uh, a very rich learning experience. And in a sense, you know, if you think about it, it the fact that this approach resonates is uh, makes sense because this is probably one of the oldest forms of knowledge and knowledge gathering if you think back to um, a lot of indigenous societies, a lot of societies where oral traditions are have uh, such strong roots. So uh, really building on and using that approach in this process. Uh, as well as the learning circle, we have two practice sites who are part of the initiative, and you hear from uh, both of them today, Interior Health and Ottawa Public Health. We had a third who unfortunately had to uh, leave the project, and we can talk about that later because I think the, that example actually highlights some of the issues around organizational capacity broadly. So on your screen right now, this gives you a sense of what is going into the initiative. So I spoke about briefly about the practice sites. Uh, Ottawa Public Health is focusing on client and community engagement, and Interior Health in D.C. is looking at equity integrated population health status reporting particularly around opioid use. Alongside that, we have a learning circle, which, is, which consists of researchers and practitioners, uh, two of whom are on the line today, as well as NCCDH. 
Uh, we're also supported by an advisory group, which uh, we meet with um, two to three times a year. And it's really valuable having your input and having them have a bit of distance from the initiative. Uh, so we're bringing in research and practice-based evidence, expert opinion, experiential knowledge. And one of the things which really emerged very early on when the Learning Circle met was the importance of us getting what we're learning through the sites and through the Learning Circle conversations out the field in a timely manner, hence our webinar today. So throughout the course of the initiative, we're going to be doing webinars as well as print uh, publications which will be available on our website. I just want to acknowledge that this is a team effort and lots of people within the center have been involved in the project, some of whom are on the line. And also that our Learning Circle members really bring a ton of expertise to the initiative and we're really grateful to have them alongside us in this learning journey. So if our Learning Circle members are on the line, thank you for all you've done through the course of this project. So through our Learning Circle discussion, what we're really emphasizing is that we are trying to create a learning community where we're encouraging everyone to bring their voice, their hearts, their ears, their minds to the conversation. And we're hoping that in situating all participants as, in a sense, equal learners in this process, right, the, the ability for issues, tensions, confirmation of things which are really nicely aligned uh, will surface throughout the initiative. So what do we hope is going to happen at the end of this? And we're aware that our anticipated out outcomes are fairly long term, but really part of our interest in doing this work is to be able to support public health organizations, for those of you on the line, to be able to uh, identify those different components needed for organizational capacity for health equity, and to continue to improve our understanding of what we know supports and uh, supports health equity work within organizations and also some of those barriers, and we're working to highlight tools as we go through uh, the initiative in the hopes that over time organizations will be able to uh, take up some of these ideas, refine them, challenge them maybe, and ultimately shift what happens within the context of um, individual public health organizations. So we have been building on a lot of work which has already gone on. I just want to acknowledge a few of the places where we've been drawing very heavily from. Uh, Dr. Polly just spoke about the equity lens, so that has been a really good source of knowledge and information from us. Uh, Dr. Cohen is on the line and her work around uh, developing a conceptual framework for organizational capacity for public health action. Uh, public health equity action has also been useful. And then the practice perspective have, have been incredibly important. So in Ontario, uh, Lambton Public Health has developed a framework and assessment tools uh, on this topic, as well as some folks out of the U.S. So when we started this, um, this initiative, we said we're not going to try and do this from scratch, but we were going to go and see what is out there and try and consolidate. So going into our very first Learning Circle uh, meeting, which we hosted in person in May last year in Montreal, we did a little bit of uh, you know review and synthesis of some of these existing tools, and then shared with the group and said, okay, so here's where we are here. There seems to be some fairly good alignment in the, in the field, in the literature. So if I look at the comments, you started sharing this uh, in the chat box earlier, I'm seeing that similar alignment. So uh, really using these, I think, eight core areas as the, the what of organizational capacity to help us, the places in which we wanted to dig deeper. So we brought this into the very first Learning Circle meeting and facilitated a conversation with Learning Circle members and the practice life to say, in these areas, what, where do you want to spend your time really focusing on? And so based off of that, we take the, the specific themes into each Learning Circle conversation. Uh, also important, so at the very bottom of the slide there, those blue bubbles, is the importance of change and multiple levels, and I think, again, um, Bernie's piece really highlights that very strongly. The other ideas we are exploring through the course of the initiative is really the capacity of organizations to change. Uh, so consistently, organizations who have experience in sort of change management in, in other topic areas are typically more able to um, move forward with these ideas, largely because they may already have processes in place which they can adapt to new initiatives. And so we'll be focusing on change capacity during our next uh, initiative webinar in March. So for today's purposes, I'm going to spend the rest of my time uh, just highlighting 
what, what these various components will look like in terms of health equity. And again, you'll see a lot of resonance with some of what has already come up. So uh, governance is really just thinking about the, in a way, the values and beliefs that drive what organizations do. A lot of the times, they're unspoken, they're unsaid. It's just, you know, it's in a sense, the way we do business, the way things work. Um, it can also be highly organized. And governance is really concerned with how power is exercised in the context of organizations, how organizations make everyday decisions. Uh, the arts and uh, I'll call them artifacts, which organizations have produced to, to indicate their positions on certain things. So I've um, already talked about strategic plans. So in terms of health equity governance, uh, we see like the, it's really important for organizations to highlight that at the strategic plan level. And we see lots of examples of that happening across the country, as well as uh, through clear vision benchmarks. So I want to talk a little bit about um, governance bodies. So thinking outside of the everyday administration. So in in various uh, public health organizations, it may be a board of health, it may be a board of directors. So to what extent are values and principles related to equity, inclusion, and anti-oppression part of how those bodies are composed of who sit on them, and how those decision-making bodies actually make decisions? So what kinds of considerations? are put forth as they decide what, what priorities the organization is going to focus on. Um, Bernie noted acute care as a systems constraint. So here we see really that commitment to crime and prevention being really salient in terms of health equity. And we know that the different models of the public health governance across the country, so especially for organizations who have a say, closer link to the acute care system, and even for those who don't, that overall commitment to primary prevention is generally supportive of, um, of health equity practice. Uh, leadership is obviously an important driver for this work. So, not, so having organizational leaders at every level as health equity champions really supports, supports this work. And I want to highlight that last bullet. So oftentimes we see that organizations have one equity champion. So what happens is that person leaves and the work falls. So this really speaks to the importance of building in systems in place so that as leadership transitions, uh, the values of health equity, that vision, and that um, the health equity activities within organizations uh, stay, stay in the work of organizations. My apologies, I have um, a fire truck going through right now. Uh, the second element of organizational capacity I wanted to highlight is just the resources to do this work. So, uh, if we think about how much of public health, how much of health care spending goes towards public health, I think typically in public health we say it's not enough. And then when we think about what goes to initiatives and programs to support work on social, the social determinants of health and health equity, we really need to ask ourselves, are the resources available sufficient to meet the need? And in terms of um, ideas around scarcity, I think we need to actually challenge those and think about how we grow the resources available for this work. And also really, this is long-term work. We're trying to build long-term partnerships, develop work with communities. And it's important for the resources which are available to be continuous and sustained so that we actually can spend time developing long-term strategies. And here are some questions or, uh, you can ask yourself if you think about the resources. So really, first of all, do you have resources available for health equity initiatives? And how, how does this funding show up? Is it integrated into, pro, into your regular operational budget? Or is it project-based, which means that in two years that you lose the, um, those resources? And that's a question of, are the resources available proportionate to the program and policy needs in that area? And are you using an equity analysis in your budgeting processes? Um, also, that last piece there is, is what's the burden of proof for health equity initiatives? Are we are they subjected to similar standards as other initiatives, or is the burden of proof higher? So, I think uh, these kinds of questions can give organizations some point of reflection as you talk about um, budget priorities um, around public health initiatives broadly and health equity specifically. The third component of organizational capacity I wanted to highlight is just the data and the information to uh, drive this work. And again, Bernie mentioned this, and Sana in her presentation on interior health will share a little bit about how interior health is thinking about this. 
So really here, it's uh, ensuring that our regular surveillance and reporting systems and processes have a strong equity orientation and analysis. And that once we have that information available, it's actually used to inform what we do as organizations. And that, that information is shared with the community, so communities can take them up, um, the, the data up as they choose to. Uh, and also, there's a piece around managing that information, so really ensuring that there's a good flow of knowledge and information within the organization internally and also with community partners. Uh, we've seen a lot of organizations develop tools. So for those of you who are developing tools, really encouraging you to share them. Uh, we know of examples where tools have been developed in one context and uh, other organizations have taken them up. And with very, very minor changes, I have been able to um, implement that I think in terms of maximizing resources, that's a really good way uh, to do that, really adapting and using existing resources where possible. Uh, so we all know and uh, know that the social terms of health really require that we develop strong and meaningful relationships with sectors both um, non within health and outside of health. And so organizational capacity then, we need to think about what organizations, how organizations orient their systems to be able to do that. Uh, community engagement often takes time and I think Organizations can actually spend the time and the resources to actually make sure that those engagements are meaningful and also that um, we're actually seeking and supporting those partnerships and respecting that voice and the input we get from community when that does happen. I also want to highlight the importance of having the infrastructure to support the engagement in long-term multi-sectoral engagement initiatives and on like the very day-to-day -day basis, really thinking about how we can support participation in, in little ways. And the last bit is really, and here you'll see the link again to, um, to governance, so really thinking about how we share decision-making power with partners and with communities. So what can we let go of in terms of decision-making power, and how do we start to diffuse some of that uh, power in community and in partners? Uh, the next point I want to highlight is the workforce and human resource capacity. And I think what we tend to see is that a lot of organizations usually uh, start here. So when organizations start to think about uh, doing work on health equity and start to think about capacity issues, uh, most of us do think about building the knowledge and skill of our staff. So I want to encourage us to extend beyond knowledge and skill of staff, um, which is really important. So thinking about how we increase accountability for health equity, so really integrating this into uh, program development, performance evaluation, and also thinking about who is part of the organization, so which voices are presented at all levels of the organization, what the leadership tables look like. And again, I'm seeing a lot of resonance with some of what you were saying earlier, Bernie. So really that idea of substantive diversity and representation across all levels of organization. Uh, so this can be done through different ways. Um, organizations typically uh, think about this in terms of hiring, so how you create job postings, uh, who you recruit for, and for existing staff, and even for new staff, how you provide uh, regular training and skill building to meet the needs of, uh, of health equity work. So I'm going to pause here and um, really turn the view to the system. So a couple of things I've just talked about relate to what happens within the organization. Uh, I think Bernie shared a really great example of the fact that organizations operate within the broader context. And that context can be supportive of health equity work, or sometimes it can be a bit more um, challenging. So uh, the structures within which organizations find themselves often impact the ability to uh, implement health ex equity initiatives. So the ways in which we are addressing this through the initiative is through this particular initiative will most likely be uh, through our evaluations when we go and start to talk to the practice sites about what like what was happening uh, in your in your community which was supporting this work or not. So things really think about things beyond uh, beyond the organization itself. We often see that in in contexts where there is sort of a history of health equity work. Um, organizations are more able to implement uh, and uh, 
government, resource allocation plays a significant role. So in Ontario, for example, as you think about legislation to support the, the social terms of a broad policy, the Ontario Public Health Standards have provided public health units in this particular province with a really good foundation and lever to say that health equity, yes, is a core part of what public health is supposed to be doing and really supports um, public health to do that work. Uh, when Tanya O'Connor comes on, I think she, you'll hear a lot about how the standards are supported in the work they're doing at um, Ottawa Public Health. Uh, the external context also includes, um, I think, again, really macro things. I think about macro economic and social policies. Uh, one of the things I think has been really supportive of health equity work on a global scale is the WHO Commission on the Social the Terms of Health. And we're about, I think, 11 years into the release of that report. And so we're starting to see a lot of people take stock and say, what has happened over the last 10 years? And what does that mean for what organizations do? So we'll, if folks are interested, we can share some of those um, stock-taking papers for your interest. I also wanted to highlight this last bit. We talked about public support and trust. So oftentimes, um, when there is community demand or support for health equity work, it can sometimes even validate the work organizations are doing. And in some cases, it can just push organizations to go in areas which they may not necessarily feel uh, completely prepared for work, but when there is this public uh, public demand and push and support, it sometimes facilitates uh, organizations' ability to take action on health equity. So through all this initiative, we have started to introduce, introduce this idea of multiple change at the organizational level. Uh, so uh, this chart on your screen really just provides a high-level sense of the kinds of questions organizations can be addressed. So imagine that you're looking at, let's say, human resources to support health equity. There are some things which you need to think about at the individual level. So that could be, uh, do you have team goals to support health equity at the individual level? Right? And so that's a job performer level. And then also thinking about, have you designed the job to actually be able to do health equity work? And in terms of management, uh, consider whether or not you have the right people, whether you have the right training, wh whether or not people are rewarded for the kinds of things which we, um, you say people should be doing in terms of health equity. Uh, and then the process then is thinking how does everyday work happen within the organization? So most, most organizations have just, you know, ways of working. So really ensuring that those health equity goals are incorporated into how the organization functions, how the organization thinks about monitoring and improvement, and really building it it into core uh, core processes. On the organizational level then, it's really where the strategy and the policies get set. Here's where we're also talking about organizational values. Uh, so what values are driving decision making within the organizations? Are those values shared or are they held by an individual? And how do you create an organizational conversation and signal organization that health equity is important? So. Uh, if we go back to the idea of governance, here's again where you want to have strategies, policies to guide uh, to guide the work, and also where a lot of the decisions around resource allocation start to happen. So really thinking about whether or not resources are being allocated in a manner which helps do uh, the health equity initiatives as the organization would like. So these are some of the ideas which we are exploring in the context of the initiative. And so throughout the context, throughout the initiative, we will continue to host webinars where we explore uh, some key ideas which, come, which have come up during the project. I wanted to highlight some resources and tools for you which are available on our website. And I think um, some of my colleagues are dropping those into the chat box. And uh, a few years ago, we did a case study with folks in Ontario just trying to understand what they were doing in their own context. So that gives you a sense of some of the work already happening uh, in the field, as well as a guide from uh, from the Center for Disease Control, which has a really nice short uh, questionnaire on organizational capacity. So I encourage you to take a look at those if you're not familiar with them, and again, they can just help them further your work a little bit. 